My name is Ed Acevedo, and I'm a professor and chair in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Sciences at Virginia Commonwealth University. This series of interviews that we're conducting is in conjunction with the UCI World Road Racing Cycling Championships that will be held here in Richmond beginning on September 19th. Today, my guest is Dr. Janet Rankin from Virginia Tech University. Uh, Dr. Rankin is a professor in the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods, and Exercise. Highly regarded in the field, she has also been elected uh, in the past to serve as president of the American College of Sports Medicine. Welcome. I'm so glad you were able to make it here today, Thank Dr. You. Rankin. Thank you. Yeah. Thrilled to be here. Great. I think what I'd like to do is to start with making sure that you and I and the audience have kind of a general understanding of sports nutrition and nutrition itself. So maybe you can give us kind of a general description of nutrients, nutrition, before we start applying it to the cyclists that will be here. Okay. Yeah, the, the study of nutrition is basically what we eat um, and our requirements for those different nutrients. So you can talk about basic health connection to nutrition for the entire population. When you talk about an athlete, often they have special needs, sometimes because they expend so much energy or even specific nutrients that might be uh, required in higher amounts for athletes. So they're very focused on performance and their body composition. So many of our recommendations focus on those two things. So what I'd like to focus in now is on kind of the challenges for uh, the cyclists during their race. So one of my first thoughts is maybe we'll start talking about hydration needs. Yeah, that would be the most extreme um, challenge, uh, it sounds like, for the race coming up here. Um, you know, about a five hour, very high intensity, uh, sustained high uh, work output. And that's challenging for multiple uh, reasons for nutrition, including calorie needs that can jump at least tenfold over what it is at rest. Uh, and in addition, if it is hot, uh, you'll have a lot of sweating. We have to cool the body. So we, we don't want to get overheated. So the way that we do that is through producing sweat that must evaporate. If it's very humid, it's harder to evaporate that sweat. You don't cool as efficiently and your body heat can rise. So that produces more sweat. So over a five hour period, you could lose quite a bit of body water. So critical that the athlete tries to replace some of that water during the event, not wait till afterwards to rehydrate. Because we know that even as little as 2% of a drop in your body weight from dehydration can impair performance. So these athletes want to do everything they can from a nutrition standpoint to maintain their performance and not have it be um, deteriorated. Right. And so they're sweating. It's critical for cooling and for human performance and functioning mm -hmm. to keep fluid and stay hydrated. But in that sweat, it's not just water. Right. What are some other things in that sweat that they're losing mm -hmm. that they may want to really pay attention, and they do pay attention mm -hmm. to, trying to replace? Yeah. Yeah, sweat, if you taste your sweat, you know it tastes salty. So certainly sodium and chloride are in there, and also potassium and some other minerals. I'd say sodium chloride is the main thing that we lose in addition to water in, in sweat. So if you're just doing a short ride and you sweat a little bit, it's no problem. But in a five hour, very hard race in Richmond, they could be losing significant amounts of uh, sodium chloride, that salt, as well as water. So what we'd want is that athlete to consume um, water with electrolytes in it. Electrolytes mean sodium and potassium and maybe um, chloride. So sports drinks are an easy way to do that. You could make your own sports drinks, but the, the commercial sports drinks are just convenient. Um, and they have uh, the electrolytes in the appropriate uh, concentration um, to help replace that as well as the fluid. So 
they're going to be taking not just water, it should include this other nutrient that is being released from the body. Um, in doing that, they're going to put it back in. You mentioned concentration. How, what's the critical role of concentration in what you're putting back in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the other thing that's usually in sports drinks and that you need to replace in a five-hour um, hard bike race is carbohydrate. And to put that in perspective, uh, typical um, soda is about, or orange juice, what might be 11% carbohydrate. Sports drink, maybe 10% carbohydrate. Most sports drinks are in the six to eight percent carbohydrate. Um, that's found to be ideal as far as stomach emptying. If you drink something that's very concentrated, it stays in your stomach a while before there's a release and absorption can happen. That's uncomfortable with someone who's trying to work very hard. So most uh, commercial drinks are in that six to eight percent carbohydrate range and the electrolyte concentration is also in the range that is most likely to be absorbed well um, and not um, stay in the gut or in the stomach too long. So scientific studies have shown these are the concentrations, this is what's going to work best when mm -hmm. performing uh, endurance mm -hmm. sport in this case. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just change the topic a little bit or, or transition to talking about a regular cyclist. Mm -hmm. I'm planning a 50 minute bike ride mm -hmm. this weekend mm -hmm. uh, with my wife mm -hmm. and we're probably going to mountain bike. What do we have to worry about? What should we be doing? Yeah, I'd say primarily water. And I'm a cyclist. Uh, I'm a, you know not a competitive cyclist. I'm doing more of those kind of things. Sometimes multiple hour. Um, I take water. If it's an hour or less, definitely water is all I take. If it turns into a two hour or longer, I might have one water and then a sports drink, two bottles, and then maybe I have a snack, uh, some bars or something that I want to eat part way through. Um, hydration in just the hour long ride is the most important thing, especially depending on the conditions. If it's a hot, humid day, you still could lose a lot of sweat mm -hmm. within an hour. Uh, you have uh, made a commitment to working with organizations mm -hmm. that try to have an impact on communities mm -hmm. to become more physically active. And one of those associations that I think you're linked with is Active Earth. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about Active Earth? Sure, I'd be happy. I'm very passionate about this. Um, you know, we've been talking about cycling, for example, and uh, the average person in the United States anymore, we don't use cycling or walking for transportation much. We used to a long time ago, and actually many other countries have a very high um, proportion of people that will walk or cycle to their destination. Um, in the U.S., uh, it's about 3.4 percent of, of commutes are done walking or cycling. Over in Europe, European countries, sometimes up to 50 percent. So uh, that is one way that we're um, not getting physical activity where we used to, or kids walking to school. Um, anymore in my community, the parents are driving them to school instead of walking or biking. So we're missing out on an opportunity to get more physical activity on a daily basis. And so this idea of active earth is that if we um, get more accessible and safe uh, uh, opportunities for active transportation, that'll help people be more physically active on a daily basis. We know that that's then tied to improved health and reduced health care costs. Um, it also has an impact our, on our environment. You know, we hear about global warming almost every day in the news. And in the U.S., about a third of the greenhouse gas production comes from transportation. So I think if we could enhance the use of active transportation, walking and biking for short trips, I'm not talking about your 20 mile commute that you're gonna walk that, um, but actually 25% um, of trips are a mile or less. Um, that's walkable. Um, I walked over here about a mile. 50% uh, of our trips are 10 miles or less and that's bikeable, but most of us don't consider either of those two things. So if we could enhance the choice to be um, walking and biking instead for short trips, we could improve our health, reduce the cost of health care, improve our environment.
Well, Dr. Rankin, thank you so much. I think that uh, I learned some and our audience learned a lot. So again, thank you so much for coming and visiting with us. Thank you, I enjoyed it.